so we will get started. If we could go to the first slide, please, Elois. So I am Mary Ellen Davis, the Executive Director of ACRL, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Pilot uh, Virtual Leadership Council. For those of you that are used to going to midwinter, this is what we normally would be doing Friday afternoon next week. But we have heard from many of you that you don't always attend midwinter, and with ALA transitioning to a new meeting, we thought this would be a good chance to, uh, to try out a virtual meeting. So we'll be asking you about that at the end on the evaluation. We really appreciate your making time to volunteer and to serve the profession in this way. We know how busy you are. We know that your jobs keep getting more and more things added to them. And so making time to do your ACRL service work is a real gift to the association and the profession. So thank you for that. One of the things that uh, I often get asked about is, is who gets invited to leadership council and why are we here? So I want to just go through kind of the groups real quickly. So um, if we could go to the next slide, Elois, we have the uh, board of directors here and here are the ones that were gathered uh, when we did our last picture. And we have a number of um, membership groups. And so if we go to the next slide, you can see that we have people that are here from um, Oops, my chat box is in the way. Chapters, committees, discussion groups, ed boards, representatives, task force, the leaders of all that group. And then of course, we have our many communities of practice. So we've got sections, interest groups, and, and other groups that who knows we may invent, or maybe with the ALA organization that we'll hear about, maybe there'll be yet another group that, uh, that we will have. And then finally, last but not least, we have with us our candidates who are standing for the ACRL Board of Directors. So I'd like to, to issue a, a warm welcome to all of you, and I hope that you will find this session informative and helpful, and you'll get a chance to tell us how you feel at the end on the evaluation. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the ACRL President, Karen Monroe, who is Associate Dean of Libraries for Learning and Research Services at Simon Fraser University. Karen, over to you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Is the mic working okay? Great. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, before I go further, I'm going to just uh, do a quick acknowledgement of the land and the territory that I am working on today. We are a distributed group, but I'm working from today from uh, the lower mainland of BC in Canada. And we have a practice of doing land acknowledgements for significant events and meetings. So I'm just going to acknowledge that the land that I am on today is unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam people. I also wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping details for our meeting. Uh, first of all, we are recording the presentation portions of the meeting today uh, for folks who can't make it. Uh, so just to let you know about that. And second, I, I wanted to just uh, pass on a very quick reminder. I hope you have heard this before this year. Uh, we are in an election year in the United States. <clears throat> and it's just a reminder that as members of ACRL, you cannot, with your member title, support candidates or use any ALA resources to support a candidate. For example, conversational listservs on Connect, those kinds of things. Those are, are important because they could jeopardize ALA's tax status. So we have to be completely impartial in our roles. So that said, those are a couple of just general housekeeping details to bear in mind uh, throughout your service. Um, and then I would like to echo Mary Ellen's thanks to everyone for being here today and also for your service, your participation in ACRL and your service as member leaders. We, we live, ACRL could not do what it does without everyone who's here today. I wanted to share a few updates from my position as president, a few things that I've been learning and that I've been involved with. First of all, I wanted to just make a, a quick mention of the fact that we are in an experimental virtual meeting today. And you may be aware that this is part of a longer trajectory that ALA is taking towards uh, midwinter meetings. So we're not expecting major changes to this year's midwinter meeting in Philadelphia, but ACRL really wanted to try to get ahead of the curve because we know there are changes coming. We expect that in 2021, midwinter will be on a slightly smaller footprint in Indianapolis. And then in 2022 in San Antonio, we expect to see a new event launch from ALA. The event that they will be launching will have a planned emphasis on youth media, leadership development, future of libraries of EDI, although it's still, the planning is still underway by ALA conference committee and conference services. So you can find out more and connect about the future of midwinter. And certainly as far as today's meeting, please do give us feedback on how the virtual meeting works for you. Speaking of changes, there are many changes afoot in ALA. Uh, and I'm sure that is on the top of many people's minds. 
Um, one of the biggest streams of change that we are facing right now is SCOE, which is the Steering Committee on Organizational Effectiveness. I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder. You may have seen, if you've looked at the agenda, that we're lucky to have some time today with Lessa Playa Lozada, who is the chair of the committee, the steering committee, as well as Emily Daly, who's an ACRL board member and who has been ably representing ACRL and also taking part fully in the work of the committee. So the board is attending very closely to the work of SCOE, of that committee, and uh, we will continue to keep members updated on that work as it progresses. There are other streams of change underway as well, you may be aware that ALA recently, the ALA board recently voted to sell the ALA headquarters building in Chicago, meaning that staff will be moving in late April to a new, show, a new location that will also be in Chicago. And there'll be more on that soon, I'm sure. There was also a large announcement yesterday, I hope everybody caught that, that uh, the new executive director from, for ALA was announced and that person will be Tracy Hall. Some people may be familiar with Tracy already, Tracy worked with ALA previously as Director of the Office of Diversity from 2003 to 2006. She's held numerous leadership roles in libraries, academe, and in policy organizations. She's an active writer and a speaker on topics spanning service innovation and racial equity in librarianship, arts administration, and the creative economy, as well as social justice. So Tracy will be starting her work as Executive Director with ALA more or less immediately, officially in February, but she will be at midwinter next week. Mary Geekus, who's currently in the ALA executive director role, she will continue in that supporting role until June. So there will be a, a good bridge between those two uh, individuals in that position. I think Mary Ellen might've just shared a link to that news in the chat. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted also to give everybody today an update on the work that the ACRL board has been taking on in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. You might recall that we recently, in the last two years, it would, the board created a new core commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, meaning that the work of EDI is infused throughout the, all units of the association, meaning division level committees, sections, task groups, and so on. I wanted to share just a few highlights of, about some of the work that's going on in this area. Uh, for starters, last year's ACRL President's Program at Annual Conference was on an EDI theme, and that theme will continue this year. It will also be on an EDI theme. So we'll be continuing to, uh, to use that very high profile opportunity to, opportunity to emphasize the importance of this work. There'll be more details coming out from the Planning Committee soon. ACRL has also joined a joint task force with ODLOS, the Public Library Association, and ARL. ODLOS is the ALA Office for Diversity. Uh, this is a project working on building cultural proficiencies for racial equity. It's a framework that this group is, is putting together. There was an open call put out this fall and that group has now been appointed. The framework will serve as a foundational resource to help public and academic libraries build inclusive cultures in libraries and in their broader communities through guidelines on the development and implementation of organizational policies and professional practices. Overall, I would say there's so much going on in ACRL throughout the association on EDI work that it's hard to summarize. Those are a couple of examples I wanted to point out, but I would say that if you're interested in knowing more or if you're working with a group and you're wondering what sorts of activities are already underway or what you might do, there is an excellent live guide that ACRL staff have put together. You can find it quite easily if you Google ACRL EDI live guide. I think that might be the easiest way to find it. If you take a look, you'll see that there's working, work happening across the association at all levels to uh, change culture and to create opportunities and to bolster equity, diversity, and inclusion across ACRL. One of the things in addition that we are doing again this year that we started last year was uh, we, we are asking optional demographic questions when we send out the call for ACRL volunteers. We started that last year asking questions about uh, volunteers, ethnicity, race, and gender, just to start benchmarking our progress and to understand where we are, to hold ourselves accountable and to be transparent about the makeup of our leadership member group. Uh, so we'll continue to do that this year. And that is a very good segue to point out that the call for volunteers is out now. And so please, I encourage you to volunteer and to encourage others to volunteer the deadline 
for volunteering is February 14th. And yes, you do need to fill out the form in order to, to have a volunteer appointment. We would very much like to see you back again and to have uh, other folks that you might encourage or recommend to serve in those roles. So those are my updates for, uh, for today for the moment. And I'm very pleased to pass things over now to John Cawthorn, who is our ACRL Vice President, President-Elect. Thank you, Karen. I uh, really am excited to be here and represent uh, all the people in ACRL and particularly those who are standing for appointment. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I am a little bit ahead of all of you in this process and I, what I've learned is that we have an, a tremendous, tremendously talented staff at ACRL and uh, Mary Ellen did not take the time to introduce all of them, but all of you should be familiar with them and their work. They, it's really been quite extraordinary for me to get up close and see all the hard work that they do. Of course, I um, have been learning a lot uh, about how big and complex ACRL is and then how it fits into ALA. Uh, I've also been learning about the nominations process. I thought I had to appoint like 40 people or something like that, and it turns out it's more like 340 people. And I want to encourage people uh, to uh, reach out to folks to really uh, fill out the nomination uh, cards so we can really look at um, a broad representation of folks on the on the committee uh, on the committees within ACRL. I think one of the things I've learned uh, another thing I've learned about being in this position is that some of the work that the pre previous presidents do before I become president really have to continue. So this continuation of EDI and also the the shoring up and sort of revisiting the nominations process is really, really very important. I think we can make some really good changes in there. I also have to say that I'm really pleased about the president's calls that we do every week. I thought every week was a lot, but it turns out uh, it's probably not enough. Uh, we, we talk about a lot of things that uh, are very important. And uh, I, I am interested in leadership, of course, the craft of leadership. And I think some of the things that I'll be talking about in this coming six months and in certainly in the next year is leadership and organizational development. And there's many things that, be, that we can hang off of that, but th it should have a focus kind of on the work of EDI and the Diversity Alliance, which I'm also very, very pleased that it's at ACRL and thank uh, Mary Ellen for her leadership to bring it to ACRL. Uh, what, we're, what we're finding is that a lot of people are coming into residencies, but they're not really being supported or they're, fit, they're having a hard time in our organizations and the cultures that we have. And we, we, we didn't create these cultures overnight, but of course um, we have to be present to them as new people come into our organizations and our associations and we should be present to listening to those experiences. So I look forward to working with Derek and all the folks uh, who are committed to EDI and of course I just want to give a, a strong shout out to Tracy Hall. Uh, I think that's a really great uh, great news for the association and we'll, we'll make it even better news for ACRL I hope uh, working with Julius Jefferson. Uh, so that that really is is it. I think it's been a, a great pleasure to work in this role and see all my colleagues on the board and how they work together. And it's a great group. And uh, we're thinking about how we might do that um, uh, work again in spas in the fall. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Okay, so I am now going to take us through our agenda. Uh, our next item is uh, an update from Lessa Palaya Lozada and Emily Daly, who are, Lessa is chair of the Steering Committee on Organizational Effectiveness, and Emily Daly is an ACRL board member who is serving on the committee. And uh, together they will provide us with an update on where the uh, committee's work is at the moment and an opportunity, I think, for a little bit of feedback from our group. So, Lessa and Emily, please take it away. Thank you so much, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Lessa Playa Lozada, and in my regular life, I am the Adult Services Assistant Manager at the Palos Verdes Library District in Southern California and chair, as Karen said, of SCOE. And I'm here with Emily Daly, another SCOE member, and of course, ACRL, ACRL board member. 
So we've been working together for the last year and a half, listening to the concerns, feedback, and insight of ACRL members and ALA members and non-members alike to create the Forward Together report and tweak and change them. And we hope that we, you can, all can see the changes influenced by your feedback just even since annual conference. So to that point, I would like to also start by saying thank you to all of you for participating in that process over the last year and a half with us, and likely before we even started our work, and for aiding in the creation and continual development of these recommendations. So we do have um, about 20 minutes together today and would like to use that time to first do a very high level overview of the Forward Together recommendations and then talk a bit about SCOE's work moving forward. And then I'm gonna turn it on over to Emily who will speak to Forward Together and ACRL. And then we're gonna have a very brief Q&A slash feedback session and then we're gonna go over next steps with you folks. So as we go over the recommendations, I do want to reiterate the iterative nature of this process throughout this whole thing. We started with a challenge from then ALA President Jim Neal in 2018, who tasked SCOE with reviewing and recommending changes to ALA's governance model. Now, why did he do this? Declining membership numbers since the 2008 recession where ALA never fully recovered, and a membership survey of current and lapsed members indicated that members passed present and future couldn't justify the cost of membership. They didn't see the value and they didn't feel engaged. Our ultimate goal through all of these recommendations is to look towards a unified ALA with strong member engagement, true inclusion, and to shift to a knowledge-based organization from one that is mired and bogged down in process, rights, and entitlements. This indicates a huge culture shift for us as an association and how we operate and how we interact with one another. And it's all rooted in what our members think the ALA of the future should look like. Could I have the next slide, please? So the future of ALA must enable consistent, strategic, and effective member engagement, enable organization-wide planning, be financially sustainable, enable sustainable long-term change, next slide please, and allow stakeholders to have confidence in decisions made when they are not in the room. I think that's one of the biggest ones that we have to work on. And deliver high value support and impact for members. We also want to make sure that we must pursue environmental sustainability in our activities as an association. And of course, I know you folks talk a lot about this, is centering equity, diversity, and inclusion in our decision-making processes and in how we articulate our values. So now that we are all rooted in the ALA of the future, how does Forward Together imagine we get there? First, by imagining a 12-month association like you folks are trying to do right now, rather than a twice-a-year association where we try to do as much work as we can in between midwinter and annual. And second, by creating ways for members to contribute where they are with the time they have to dedicate to the work in groups like advisory groups, working groups, and communities of interest. So what are those three? Advisory groups are groups of members who discuss important issues to the profession and provide expertise on those issues to the board of directors. Conveners of advisory groups have three-year staggered terms. And then working groups, as you can imagine, are working groups of members tasked with specific projects or reports and usually have a year or less to complete said tasks. And then communities of interest are ALA Connect groups where members can engage on new and emerging issues and trends important to the association. There will also be six standing committees of the board who will follow the more traditional term length that we're used to right now and will focus on finance and audits, public policy and advocacy, association policy, social justice, leadership and development, and nominating. These committees will support and work closely with the board of directors who will be a 17 member body with 12 members directly elected by members and five appointed to protect itself against homogeny. The board of directors will be directly accountable to members and will also work closely with the four leadership assemblies comprised of chapters, roundtables, divisions, and affiliates to gather feedback, provide expertise, bring forth important issues, and provide an area for influence in shaping ALA and its work. 
emphasis in creating these recommendations was really placed on preserving what works, like our roundtables and our divisions, with some recommendations for modifications and alignments across the whole association so that our members can go to any area of ALA and know exactly how it works and how to engage with it. Next slide, please. And what also works well and is something that our members find the most benefit in is ALA's policy work, primarily within the realm of public policy and advocacy and legislative issues, as represented by the Public Policy and Advocacy Committee. So the three committees listed here will work closely together. The Social Justice Committee will influence and ensure the social justice framework of our association is filtered into everything we do including public policy and advocacy, as well as our own in-house association policy. Next slide, please. And all of these committees, advisory groups, working groups, and communities of interest will work with and be informed by the divisions as well, of course. If you might remember from this time last year, the ideas that we floated were drastically different, different from the ones before you today. Today, we recommend that divisions could conduct regular reviews of their division and determine if mergers like the one happening with Lama, Lita, and Alex to form core are necessary. We also recommend reviewing the operating agreement and scheduling a regular review of that rather than every 30 years or so. And replacing individual division bylaws with a shared policies and procedures document to create alignment along with aligning dues and due structures across the divisions. Next slide, please. We also recommend in the same spirit of alignment and sending an ALA member anywhere in the association to engage, aligning engagement structures with advisory groups, working groups, and communities of interest, while recognizing the importance also of sections within the divisions. So our divisions don't need all of these uh, groups. You can select which ones you want. And with sections, we do see the need to retain sections, but we would like to ask in the Forward Together recommendation that sections within our divisions determine if they can be reconstituted as something else and potentially reimagine their work to provide greater member engagement and ensuring what tenure track leadership roles look like. Next slide, please. And so we do see this work taking about two years for implementation after approval by members, which is probably another one to two years down the road. So really we're looking at a total of four to five years before we see final-ish changes here. None of this will happen overnight and we're still a bit of ways away from being ready to vote on anything. Next one, please. And then there are also other important recommendations that didn't have any large structural home like conducting a regular review of our association's governance structure to make incremental change rather than a huge overhaul like we need now. Also designing a robust virtual member orientation, which I understand is actually already underway in the membership office and with the membership committee. And developing an ALA wide clearinghouse for volunteer opportunities where members can put their hat in the ring at any time not just once a year. And so as opportunities arise, we can identify expertise and interest in a 12-month association rather than a twice a year association. And those individuals will be able to be cross-identified through roundtables and divisions and different communities of practice and all of that. Because an engaged year-round active membership is our ultimate goal and where we members ultimate, where our members ultimately will find their value in ALA. Next slide, please. So to be clear, that was a whirlwind overview of the recommendations that barely scratched the surface. So I do encourage you all to download and read our beautiful 60 page document, which has four appendices. I'm sure you academic librarians will appreciate that. Um, Appendix D, the membership survey results, I think are particularly interesting, especially if you're trying to understand the why we need all of this and how we got to this point. So now what's next for Forward Together? The ALA Executive Board met in October and decided that with the multiple streams of change occurring in ALA and the huge changes of a new executive director and moving to a new location and coupled with the important feedback from our members that they need the details, 
rightfully so, to go along with the big picture of Forward Together. A new team will be formed in spring of 2020 to identify and delve into the information that's needed. This will likely include a more in-depth fiscal analysis, testing, and replacement bylaws language for members to see. Now, the composition of this group is to be determined, partially because we're waiting for the Committee on Organization and the Constitution and Bylaws Committee to report out what major structures and what bylaws will be affected by Forward Together. Next slide, please. And once we have this information, we can begin determining who would be a best fit for this committee, recognizing that there are many stakeholders throughout this process and there will likely be multiple levels of engagement going forward. And we also know that ACRL and PLA really want to be involved in this process as well and making sure that we can accommodate our needs for everyone. And because a lot of this is still to be determined and in a very fuzzy, nebulous stage, which makes a lot of us very uncomfortable, including myself, um, the timeline has been pushed back again. So voting is now anticipated for January 2021, which is one year from now, with a full member vote in spring of 2022. Of course, this timeline is subject to change. And if it does, it'll be in the direction of more in the future, though. Don't worry, nothing is happening any sooner. I'm almost positive about that. So thank you for this very brief overview of Forward Together. Please do look at the full report and our website to find out more. And now I'm going to hand it over to Emily. Phew, that was a lot. Thank you, Lessa. Again, I'm Emily Daly, and I'm a director at large on ACRL's board of directors and a member of SCOE. It is really important to SCOE that the recommendations that Lessa has just provided an outline of will work well for all of our members. As Lessa mentioned, we heard your concerns at Leadership Council in June, and I hope that you can see that we incorporated a lot of your feedback into the Forward Together report, which I linked in the chat box just now. You'll see the first link goes to the Forward Together website, and the second link goes to the full report. As SCOE transitions from ideation phase to the implementation phase, we want to be sure we have support from ACRL leaders and that you have an opportunity to be part of implementing the Forward Together recommendations. We will also look to you to help inform your committees, your sections, your other communities of practice to get them excited about the changes that SCOE recommends for ALA. Next slide, please. As you may have seen in the Leadership Council packet earlier today, the ACRL and Public Library Association, PLA boards, issued a joint statement to the ALA president and copied the rest of the ALA executive board, including LESA. In this statement, ACRL and PLA thanked SCOE and LESA in particular for her heroic work and expressed support for changing ALA's complex governance structure and for standardizing the membership dues in particular. And while ACRL and PLA are supportive of many of the Forward Together recommendations, they expressed a need for more information about how SCOE's recommendations will be implemented in the divisions, especially with respect to the operating agreement, which Lessa touched on, which defines ALA policy related to the divisions and their governance, programs, and financial relationships with ALA. The statement issued earlier this week indicates that these two large divisions cannot take a position on SCOE's recommendations without more detailed information about the impact they will have on the divisions themselves. The statement also indicates that ACRL and PLA leadership would like to be part of SCOE's next steps, which of course SCOE welcomes and will look to your involvement. Fortunately, the ACRL board had a robust multi-hour discussion about the Forward Together recommendations at our strategic planning meeting in October. So I have been able to share ACRL's concerns with LESA along the way um, before the boards even issued the statement. For a variety of reasons, in response to many of the concerns that LESA described, SCOE slowed down the timeline for council and membership votes on the Forward Together recommendations. This extended timeline, as Lessa suggested, will allow the new ALA executive director time to begin her work, to weigh in on SCOE's recommendations, including the implications for the divisions. This extended timeline also gives the implementation time to think really carefully about the impact that Forward Together will have on all aspects of ALA. So with that rather large caveat in mind, Lessa and I are interested in hearing your thoughts about the Forward Together recommendations at this point. Um, you can advance to the next slide, please. We invite you to use the chat now to comment on these questions. We will have time in just a moment for you to ask any questions you have about the Forward Together recommendations themselves. But for the next two minutes, let's cast aside the details 
and focus instead on these broader questions. Which recommendations are most exciting or transformative? And which recommendations will absolutely not work for you in the role that you, you play in ACRL? Let's pause for just a moment to think a little bit about these questions and begin to, uh, to populate the chat box with your answers. And we'll imagine during this time a really loud, festive, um, boisterous uh, hotel ballroom with everyone turning to their neighbors and chatting and expressing <laughs> excitement over SCOE and forward together, maybe a little bit of uh, concern. We'll work on sound effects for the next virtual meeting, Emily. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> ambiance, ambient noise. That's right. I'm a former high school English teacher, so I don't mind an awkward pause. <laughs> okay, so Karen says that the, the exciting piece is that it's more streamlined, a legible organization with year-round membership service opportunities, not just twice a year. So Nicole mentions that there is clarity, which is exciting. Um, although concerned that she wonders where the goal area committees reside. I think there is definitely an air, a, a, a place for the goal area committees. We imagine these being committees of the board. And that's something that we talked about when, as we were developing the recommendations. Trevor mentions that we need a more streamlined organization, but still a little hard to imagine without knowing exactly how the structures will be changed. That's fair, certainly. Now they're starting to f fly in. Let's see if I can... Mm -hmm. Um, what happens to current ALA council? Uh, so in this model, council goes away. Council goes away and instead we have the committees of the board um, to carry out the functions of, um, of council, especially related to social justice and policy. The council will go away. Do you wanna say anything more about that, Lessa? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and also the functions of council, many of the functions of council, like Emily said, remain in the standing committees, but also in those leadership assemblies. Kind of that debate and that issue development will really be able to happen there, but also by not having the um, hierarchy of council and the understanding how to bring resolutions forward and such, it opens it up a little bit for a more grassroots issue-driven, member-driven way for members to communicate to the board of directors to implement new policy, to talk to the public policy and advocacy committee, to talk to the social justice committees about issues that are important to them through, they'll also be holding regular membership meetings. Um, we imagine multiple times throughout the year to have these issues heard from members so that members can be part of that creation rather than waiting for or relying upon council to do it. So we see the functions all in different kinds of places to enable more than 187 people to participate fully in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, John mentions a concern with the scale of working groups and advisory groups that doesn't quite seem to align with a 1,000 member section, and that's certainly fair. Mm -hmm. um, we're really inviting the divisions to imagine how they can overlay these recommendations on their work. Nothing is going to be strictly prescribed. We, we, want, um, we would like for divisions to work with these general models for member engagement, but we also recognize that every, every division is going to look a little bit different. Sections are going to look a little bit different, and we want to make sure that um, you have the opportunity and flexible to come up with something that, uh, the flexibility to come up with something that works well for your members. Valid answer on those, certainly. I apologize. I am just, as our as our meeting MC today, just going to give a two minute warning on timing. Yes, thank you for moving us along. Um, so I uh, would like to capture the chat here. So we will definitely do that. I want to give folks a moment to um, enter in the chat any uh, questions they have that they haven't had a chance to record already. So I promised you a chance to ask questions if you want to advance to the next slide. So this is our questions opportunity. Go ahead and add those in the chat. Um, and I uh, don't think there'll be time today to respond to your questions, but like I said, I'll, I'll get a, a capture of the transcript and I'm happy to follow up if you would like, and there's my timer, so thank you for keeping us on track, Karen. Um, if you would like for 
uh, me to respond directly, please do leave your email address. And then there are ways for you to engage moving forward. So again, if you want to advance to the next slide, please. And one more. There will be opportunities for you to um, think about, learn more about it, a virtual webinar on Thursday, February 13th. We also encourage you once again to take a look at the website, including the full report that has much more detail than what we were able to go into today. And then for those of you who are attending um, midwinter next week, there are going to be opportunities on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to learn more and to discuss. These really will be discussions about the recommendations and our next steps. Uh, I also hope you will stay tuned for an ACRL Insider post next week, which will link to the full statement that the boards issued from PLA and ACRL, so you'll be able to read that, and um, have another link to the Forward Together website and midwinter discussions. And then please stay tuned for more information about the implementation team and the opportunity to be part of implementing the Forward Together recommendations. And with that, I will thank you. And uh, thanks so much for having us. We look forward to looking at the chat. There's been a lot of activity there, which is wonderful. And I hope to see many of you in Philly next week. Thanks again. Lessa and Emily, thank you again so much. This is truly heroic work, I have to say. This is a tremendous project, a, a really complex question, a lot of really complex questions that we're dealing with. And I, I, for one, and I know many, many others, really appreciate the work that you're doing and that others on the committee are doing to move us forward. Thank you. Uh, so we will now move ahead in our agenda. Um, we do tend to, we're, we're using a fair amount of our time today to share information. That's something that we have uh, had positive feedback about in face-to-face -face leadership council. So we're using some of this time for updates now from our uh, goal area committees uh, within ACRL, uh, who will share a bit about what their work doing on in, in their committees, what their priorities and projects are. And after that, as uh, Alois said at the start, there will be an opportunity for some breakout group discussion. Just to let you know, this will not be an entire uh, meeting of, of all information sharing. So I will now <coughs> pass things to Jer Derek Jefferson, who is the chair of the ACRL Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee for an update, a brief update on what's going on with that committee. Derek? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Uh, I'm Derek, chair of the EDI Committee for ACRL. Uh, we've been doing a lot of things, a lot of brainstorming uh, of late. Uh, we appreciate that there is this new spotlight on EDI, and we don't take this for granted. Um, a lot of the work, and I've been on this committee now for about six years, has been a lot of kind of dealing with the framework and dealing with the standards uh, and through an EDI lens and uh, kind of looking at EDI in terms of human resources, um, staffing, kind of bringing librarians of color and kind of underrepresented librarians into the profession. Uh, and we really stopped to kind of to think about what does diversity, you know, what does equity, what does inclusion mean in 2020 uh, as it relates to the association and to ACRL. So one of the things that we're really focused on is looking at these silos that exist. How can we bring these silos down? Uh, we are planning an event with Odlos uh, for uh, 20, annual 2020, where we are asking people, regardless of where they are in the association, if you are in LAMA, if you are in PLA, if you are in the ethnic caucuses, if you are in Rainbow Roundtable, as uh, Social Responsibilities Roundtable. If you are doing any work in EDI, we want you to come together, bring yourself, network, and find people who are doing that work in these other areas that you may not know about. We feel like, you know, we're talking about this forward together. How can we help each other uh, move forward on practices that relate to EDI? Uh, another thing that we're really focused on is there's been a big push and a lot of focus on uh, residency program. So we're seeing a lot of attention and resources being put forth for new librarians, librarians of color and underrepresented librarians. We also want to give that same kind of attention to mid-career librarians. What does it look like to be uh, a librarian of color, an underrepresented librarian who is going up for tenure and promotion? What kind of resources are there? What kind of mentorship is there? That's something we're focused on. Um, we want to continue to build resources that relate to EDI. We do have the LibGuide that's up. Uh, we're also thinking about, uh, and Deb Sika coined this and I'm stealing it, 
Deb, uh, this J that's in front of EDI, which if you are a Star Wars nerd like me, uh, will spell out Jedi, but we are looking at the role of justice uh, through this EDI lens. So what does it look like to be kind of dealing with, say, power dynamics and systemic things and oppression uh, and social justice, which we see a lot of that infused in the work that the, the organization and our, our committee is doing. Um, again, and thinking about diversity, uh, I want to pay much more attention to uh, minority serving schools and having those have roles uh, in ACRL, looking at Hispanic serving institutions in HBCUs, uh, in junior colleges and two year colleges and community colleges. I wish that um, I was engaging more with these populations and with these people and with these colleagues and I, I hope that we can make that happen. Um, I know I don't have much time. Um, another thing is that the board, again, this is this has come down from ALA at large and from the board. So I really do appreciate that there is this transparency and this openness uh, to be looking at EDI issues. I think that this is something that a lot of uh, librarians of color and minority and underrepresented librarians think about and to have the support of, of allies and accomplices means a lot to people that look like me that are doing this work. And I look forward to kind of taking all this and, and moving forward. Uh, also a shout out to ACRL staff uh, and our, our liaisons that have been super helpful. Faye and Allison, I wanna give you a, a thumbs up and I appreciate all the work that you've done for us. Uh, and that's where we are right now. I think for the most part, we are looking at maybe three or four things that we wanna focus on uh, for the next year. And I'm gonna be working with the group in the committee to kind of finalize and make those things priorities. Uh, but we have this big laundry list to pull from and that's where we are right now. Terrific, thank you so much, Derek. Absolutely. And we will move now to the new roles and changing landscapes committee. We will hear now from Jolie Graybill, who's the chair and Aaron Smith, who's the vice chair of that committee. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Jolie Graybill, and Aaron's going to be on too as well. Um, um, step jumping in uh, if I'm leaving something off. Um, so the new roles in changing landscape committee. Um, uh, Aaron and I have been on since its inception. It's one of the newer committees, and um, we are tasked with. Um, working towards a comprehensive effort um, looking at uh, what's going on in the library um, world in terms of new roles and changing landscapes and, and taking that information and um, building professional development publications research um, advocacy if you will um, and uh, other projects that are supporting librarians in these new roles and in the changing landscapes. So um, we kind of started out slow originally, but we're, we've picked up steam really quickly and we are going to be launching this year two separate projects that um, we have been working on. Um, the first one is a leading change online course and um, it is going to be debuting this spring 2020 and it's an um, online learning course. It's uh, focusing on change management and it's self-guided, self-paced and um, it has activities and exercises that can be completed by campus teams um, and, and implemented on each campus as the the teams feel is best for their situation. Um, and the second one is, has to do with open educational resources. Um, this one's also debuting in 2020, but it'll be happening at ALA annual. And this is a day long introductory workshop and it's exploring the basics of OER. Lots of institutions, um, are at different places uh, in terms of open educational resources. And this is um, uh, an attempt to help some of the institutions that are in the beginning stages. Um, let's see, what else are we doing? So uh, we 
finished a project that ACRL tasked us with about a year ago. We finished that in June. This had to do with uh, Coupa HR and all of the librarian positions. And I think it's something that gets updated uh, about, uh, every five years. So it was um, um, just coincidental that we were able to jump in as a whole committee and take care of that project. It was um, something that we all helped with. Everyone played a role. We found it uh, very interesting actually. Um, and there were things that we suns recommended for sunsetting. There were positions that we were recommending being um, added to the list. Uh, and we finished that, like I said, in June. We put one particular project um, and starting work on identifying new projects on hold so we could complete that work. So um, one of our new projects that we're just getting um, rebooted, I guess you could say, is um, a diversity pipeline where we're utilizing a fishbone model and this is um, something that's got about six different components um, from pre-MLS, so recruiting people to um, uh, start an M MLS program from diverse backgrounds to um, mid-career to uh, leadership positions and all along that spectrum. And uh, right now what we're doing is getting our new members to the committee um, uh, identified an interest area in terms of the diversity pipeline and then getting each of the um, six areas kind of up and running and um, working on creating uh, the content for the fish bones. Um, and I think that's about it. We have uh, we're working on identifying and once since the leading change in the open educational resources are um, being implemented, we're looking forward to those being up and running for a period of time so that we can do some evaluation and assessment of those two efforts. And, and we're also looking forward to identifying our next project, um, uh, our next new role or changing landscape. We're not quite sure yet. We're doing some brainstorming on that uh, as a group to identify and kind of narrow down what we're going to be considering. And Erin, I don't know if I left anything off. That was great. I think you covered it. Okay, okay thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Julie and Erin. <clears throat> we will now move to the Research and Scholarly Environment Committee. That's chaired by Nathan Hall and Charlotte Rowe is vice chair. Thank you. And we're splitting it up and Charlotte's going first and then I'm following. Okay, great. Uh, so just a quick rundown of um, some of the things that um, have always been ongoing with the Research and Scholarly Environment Committee. Um, so the CNRL news column still publishes with every issue. Um, it's a scholarly communication focus. Um, I posted a screenshot of the most recent article, which is about planets. So that kind of thing, just sort of current issues, things that we find interesting um, to the larger ACRL audience um, about scholarly communications. And I think we have a pretty full deck ahead, but if you have any um, suggestions for a topic or an author, please do get in touch with the editors because we're always looking for new content. <clears throat> um, the ACRL Spark Scholarly Communications Forum is still, um, it looks like going to be a part of ALA annual, <laughs> I guess, um, uh, and midwinter for as long as midwinter goes on. Um, I think it's considered a high value. So that um, if that's not on your calendar, please go ahead and take a look. This um, Spark Forum for midwinter is the practicalities of big deal cancellation and journal negotiation. So again, I think that's of interest to everyone um, who is part of the ACR community, not just those working specifically in scholarly communications. Um, the scholarly communications listserv, some of you know that the listserv had um, a reputation for not being the healthiest. Um, and Nathan and I, one of the things we um, really worked on first together, even before we were um, vice chair and chair of this committee, was making um, the code of conduct 
a more um, acknowledged and used um, <laughs> code in this space. And I'm really happy with how healthy and um, useful it is to everyone now. And last but not least, the Scholarly Communications Roadshow um, has been going on for quite a while. And I think um, the success of um, an awareness of scholarly communications um, has been a testament to how, and other roadshows that have been created have been really um, great. And that's all I have there. Nathan, is there anything I missed? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is, is uh, that the, the, for the lister of the code of conduct, uh, I think be, went in effect uh, maybe six months before we started and, and that was yeah. uh, due largely to, I think Devin Savage had the, the harder time enforcing it uh, at first. And I think I saw him on the call. So uh, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, Great. he's definitely acknowledged our work and I'd like to acknowledge his as well. Um, Thank you, Devin. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, for the uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this fall we awarded seven grants to advance the work of the research agenda that we published this year, or in 2019 rather. Um, the grant review was led by MD Galvin, who led an excellent and well-documented review process. Um, also, usually uh, we release a, uh, we give a scholarship to attend OpenCon to some early career librarians. Um, Spark didn't host OpenCon this year. They're changing their format. So we didn't put out those um, travel grants this year. Um, for the rapid response, um, so one of our charges to, is to, uh, when there's a um, request for um, comment from on, on federal policies, uh, we will help draft language. And then it's sent on to uh, Mary Ellen, who who will review it, and then and then has the uh, option of of uh, responding with that language. Um, and so this um, this month, uh, uh, Allison Langham Petro of uh, University of Minnesota led the response to an NIH uh, policy proposal on um, research data um, for the. Uh, Scholarly Communication Roadshow. Um, we've had a regular subsidized, uh, we've been subsidizing that, or I should say ACRL has been subsidizing that, I think since its inception. Uh, this year, the subsidy went to, or the subsidized roadshows were awarded to California State University, Central Washington University, St. Cloud State, uh, University of Iowa, and University of Memphis. Um, that's always been uh, an application-based um, award and that was review is led by Will Cross, who's been the roadshow uh, coordinator uh, for the last term and maybe two terms. Um, so as I said, we had, we've, I think the subsidy has been in place since the roadshow's inception. And um, it's been brought up repeatedly actually that this is actually counter to ACRL's policy that uh, professional development programs must recover costs. And for a while, this was justified by the argument that this is a crucial area across academic librarianship. But more recently, there's been the argument there's a lot more resources now for learning about scholarly communication than there were 10 years ago. So during our committee's fall call, um, the consensus was that ACRL should continue a subsidy, but feels that it could be better allocated by making it available to all roadshows, but only making it available to um, historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions and community colleges, or some set of those groups. Um, so I'll be using my board update time um, to further advance this idea um, and ask for the board's consideration. And so we feel that this is closely aligned with ACRL's equity, diversity and inclusion goals. And um, also just acknowledge and appreciate uh, Derek's presentation a few minutes ago. Um, we're hoping for feedback on this idea. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to Charlotte Rowe or myself offline later if you want to figure out how to lend your voice to support this idea or if you have an idea for how it could be better. Um, thank you so much for listening. That's all for our committee. Terrific. Thank you so much, Nathan and Charlotte. Thank you. Okay. We will move on now to the Student Learning and Information Literacy Committee. We have Nicole Brown as chair and Alex Hodges as vice chair. Great, thank you, Karen. And hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. 
Um, so I'm talking on behalf of the Student Learning and Information Literacy Committee. I'll have three slides and we'll be brief. Um, our charge is to oversee the ACRL Student Learning Initiative as it's described in the strategic plan. There you go. This is also on page four of the packet that was shared this morning. Um, we work really closely like the other goal area committees with the board and other units. Um, and I want to spend our time today um, leaving this goal up for just a moment. Um, I actually want to read it. Um, our goal is to advance equitable and inclusive pedagogical practices and environments for libraries to support student learning. And the reason I took the time to read that goal aloud um, and pause here is that we rewrote this goal last year from during the strategic planning uh, meeting with the board, which is called SPAs. We don't go to a spa. We do a lot of work. And we, we wrote this goal really intentionally as our solution to infuse equity, diversity, and inclusion into our work rather than add another objective. So that's our I want to share that with everyone because it's very different um, from what it was last year. And Mary Ellen shared the um, red line version of it. So we actually have that document last year when the board voted to approve this. And I'm very proud of that work. Although it happened while I was vice chair, it's really setting the tone for how we work now. And I'll tell you how we've organized ourselves because I think that's of interest as well. We have four project teams. One on professional development, which works on with the roadshows and it also works to ensure that our time at the conferences is used well, and I'll talk more about that next. We have a group we're calling OER Toolkit, very squishy name right now, but that group is looking at what librarians might need to make their pedagogy more inclusive in open ways that are beyond um, sharing of lesson plans and things like that, something a little deeper to potentially transform what you're doing into an inclusive practice. So it's, it's open, it's exciting. The other group is publications, and we do like the group who just spoke, we have a column in CNRL News and it's popular, and we are already, we have a list of ongoing um, folks who are willing to write and work with us on those columns. And then we have an engagement team who's working to engage all the different people who are involved in student learning um, in our organization. So that's the broad overview of what we're up to. And now I'd like to share with the next slide, um, this is what I think is exciting, our upcoming activities. We are having um, two events at Midwinter. The first one is a forum. It's just called the Student Learning and Information Literacy Committee Forum. And we're going to do something that we've never done before. We're working on trying to, you know, you saw inclusive pedagogy was in the goal. But what does that mean to our community? And so we're working with um, members of our group to run um, an exercise where we begin to make meaning together. So I'm excited about that. I hope you can come to that. You don't have to be an instruction librarian to come to that. In fact, we'd love your perspective. We want to know what it means. Um, in tandem with that, another group, now I can't remember what it's called, maybe Alex will remember, that our colleague Melissa Mallon is on, um, did a survey um, around this issue as well. So we're going to be able to share across um, the organization what are we finding that people meet, think it means and what do they need to support it so i'm excited about that building on that we have another um, program called the framework professional development and we used to use that to tell people what the framework was right but we don't need to do that anymore people know so now we use it to help people engage more deeply with the framework and that will be run by the lead of our that oer toolkit team so their goal is to find out what do people really need to support inclusive pedagogy. We've got a couple of ongoing projects. Um, I didn't write the column here, but that's obviously ongoing. Um, ACRL Roadshows, we're working with curriculum designers to make sure we're infusing values of equity, diversity, inclusion into the curriculum. And I can guarantee that the work we do with the forum and the framework professional development will feed into that. There's also a new, um, Roadshow that will be announced soon, um, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, and that will sort of reside in our group along with the Framework Roadshow. And it's nice to have those two roadshows that can sort of feed off of each other and then we can talk to the other roadshow curriculum developers. So that's my report. Um, we can take questions or Alex, if there's something I missed, please feel free to toss it out there.
Um, Alex, if you have anything to add, that would be great. I think we might have to postpone questions just in the interest of time. I think Nicole did a, a great job. And uh, just to be thankful to the board to help us think through also um, creating the defining of inclusive pedagogy. I think that is um, something that we can we can help to do collaboratively um, together so that we have a common definition. Fantastic, thank you both very much. I, th I think there were a couple of questions in the chat and if either of you are willing to just uh, scoop those up and maybe respond to those offline, that would be great. Uh, and so our last goal area, strategic area committee is the value of academic libraries committee and we have Amanda Folk who is vice chair. I don't think Jill, Jill Becker is here today. Is that right, Amanda? I believe that she is on the line with us. Oh, um, great, great, yes, but terrific. I'll jump right in. And I am Jill. here, but Amanda's in charge. Okay, great. <laughs> I just got back from leave, so she's been running the show. <laughs> okay, thank you both. If I forget anything, Jill, please jump in. So our committee is charged with encouraging academic librarians to demonstrate and communicate the value that they add to their institutions very broadly to their stakeholders. Um, we have a lot of ongoing work this year, including our library impact grants, which are awarded to librarians who are doing research in support of the academic library impact report, travel grants for librarians to uh, communicate their value at conferences that go beyond the silos of librarianship. And um, there's been ongoing work on a special VAL issue of college and research libraries, and that's going to be published in April. So it's very exciting that that work is going to come to fruition soon. We have some newer work that we're embarking on. The um, Assessment and Action Roadshow, which is um, Eric Resnes oversees that, is due for a curriculum refresh and Val is overseeing that particular refresh. That work's going to kick off in earnest at midwinter. Uh, also, uh, we have a lot of disparate online resources as a committee. And so Chase Aulis and David Free, who are ACRL staff members, have agreed to work with one of our subcommittees to do somewhat of an inventory of our various resources and make recommendations for how we can um, better present ourselves online. Also, we have a new learning analytics subcommittee and they're currently doing some literature and information gathering on that topic and are going to make some recommendations about some sort of resource or toolkit or libguide um, that they think can add value to um, our professional conversations related to learning analytics. Uh, last and definitely not least, this is the centerpiece of what I'll present today, um, is our newer work uh, related to equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. There's been a subcommittee who has been working on what Val could or should be doing in this particular space, and we're excited to say that we're going to be working with um, ACRL staff member David Free to launch an equity and social justice spotlight series on ACRL Insider. So not unlike the member of the week that you may be used to seeing, but with less frequency. And here we would like to highlight colleagues both in academic librarianship and um, more broadly in higher education who are doing equity and social justice work. Talking about what is your approach to this particular work or your philosophy? What are you doing? Who are you collaborating with? What resources have you found valuable? Um, we know that uh, we've had conversations related to diversity and inclusion for a long time and we need to continue those conversations. Um, but we've done a lot less focus on equity and social justice and in many ways that's much more difficult work. So we want to start uh, conversations related both to equity and social justice. Once this launches, which we hope will happen in the next couple of months, we've already done some outreach to colleagues to consider being profiled. Um, we will have a, a nomination form of sorts. So if you have a colleague or someone that you'd really like to hear from who's doing work in this space, we welcome suggestions for that. And finally, if you have any suggestions about this equity and social justice spotlight or feedback, I'd be happy to take that and I'll put my email address in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Jill, anything to add? No, thank you, Amanda, for leading it, this in my place and the great update. Terrific. Thank you all our chairs and vice chairs of the Strategic and Goal Area Committees. Uh, these committees are large. They take on tremendously ambitious projects. And as you just heard, they are also developing new ideas and initiatives all the time, and particularly uh, paying attention to the EDI aspect of their work. So the board, I will say on behalf of the board, thank you so much for all the work you do for the association. 
Um, I want to now uh, pass the virtual mic to, um, to Beth McNeil, who is the chair of the ACRL 2021 Conference Committee for an update on their work. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Yep. We can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. I am. Um, I'm delighted to talk a little bit about the conference and hello to everyone. Specifically, I want to talk about how we've worked um, the planning committee to make the call for proposals more inclusive. So in earlier remarks today, our leaders have discussed both ACRL's commitment to EDI and reported on some of the work underway. It's really this work and the work of the board and various committees and members over the past few years that helped a small group of members um, with assistance from the very awesome Margo and Tori work last summer to focus and develop the theme for 2021, which is ascending into an open future. It's purposeful, it's honoring the location, the iconic space needle, but more importantly, it's recognizing two of ACRL's important commitments to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to equitable and open scholarship. And this theme and all the discussion led the 21 coordinating committee to a lot of discussion about how to make the conference and particularly the call for proposals more inclusive. Because we know that the path to inclusion requires work, not just individually, but in our organizations and associations, and it's crucial for our success. And that this work um, toward more inclusion requires a shift in individual thinking and also shifts in our organizations and associations, in our systems, our policies, our procedures, and our practice. And so that kind of takes us to changes for 2021, two new additions to the call for participation for 2021, an equity statement, which is on our screens, um, and then also a participation limit, which we'll get to in just a moment. So the equity statement, um, it's really, as it states, it's around ACRL's striving to develop an inclusive program that reflects the many diverse aspects of who we are and the perspectives we bring. And we're looking for presenters and topics from all over um, to add to the robust and rich um, components of what's always in every uh, conference analysis afterwards that I've ever seen, um, just a terrific conference. And we're asking our pr proposal writers to we're encouraging them, we're not, um, it's, it's encouraging them to address how their sessions and their personal and professional experiences will advance these goals and will promote equity and inclusion. And I just lost my notes. So um, it's encouraging proposals and it's, an, our, it's having the equity statement is an attempt to be transparent about it, about the selection process and that a proposal and the wording that you use in your proposal could inform the selection committee's judgment calls about whether the proposal will help ACRL meet its diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. So it's there on the um, conference website um, for individuals considering making proposals to read as they think about what they're um, going to do. And then um, the participation limit is also something the coordinating committee spent quite a bit of time um, virtually discussing. And ultimately, it's about limits, um, limits on the number of proposals one might submit and on the, while it's uncommon, it does say for an individual to have up to four proposals accepted, if that happens, um, they should plan to present just two and comply with this limit that we have asked them to consider. And you know, why this? Um, I think uh, true or not, mythology around um, seeing the same people present um, year after year, um, again, it may not be true, but that is something that various members of the coordinating committee had heard over time. And we wanted to honor that possibility, but also to think about how to bring more presenters in, in um, honor of the theme of the conference, in honor of ACRL's work with EDI uh, over several years now, and the really good work that the committees who reported today are doing in this area. And then there's also the, the reality of ACRL conferences where there are always many submissions to various types of um, the presentations you can give. Um, and by providing some limits um, on promote proposal submission and then also on the number an individual can present should help us to 
bring new voices, new perspectives um, into the ACRL conference community. And our coordinating committee felt that that was um, in line with the direction that ACRL is heading with its uh, core commitment to EDI. So as we think about, you know, those of us working in academic libraries and research libraries today, we're providing more open and inclusive collections and services. We're certainly talking about that. ACRL conferences provide a platform for sharing with each other our work in this area, our successes, and we're hopeful that these new additions to the call for proposals, the equity statement, and the participation limits will open opportunities for broader participation and additional presenters. So the call went out in the um, November issue of CNR L News, and as I said, it's also on the website. Uh, I urge all of us, um, leaders in our association, to encourage colleagues to submit proposals and also to encourage um, friends and librarians we know um, who can present on underrepresented topics, areas they're working on, or they come from underrepresented groups, encourage their participation in our association and in our conference. Thank you, Beth. Sure. We now are going to uh, experiment with a little bit of group discussion. We've, small group discussions. We've heard from uh, chairs and vice chairs uh, of a number of the committees that are moving the uh, ACRL strategic directions and priorities forward, particularly in areas of EDI. And you've heard uh, some of the initiatives and the, the new things that committees are trying, the new ways that committees are doing their work in order to move forward our priority uh, uh, for EDI. So this is a brief opportunity. I will say it's a little bit brief because we're coming up to the, uh, the end of our meeting. Um, we, I think, could take up to 10 minutes for a small breakout discussions. Uh, and we're going to be uh, put into groups. I have not done this myself, so we're putting, eyes, putting ourselves into Elois's capable hands. You will find yourself uh, asked to join a breakout group and there will be two questions that you'll be asked to discuss within your group. What is your ACRL group doing to infuse EDI into its work? And are there things ACRL can be doing to support you in this work? And I think you'll see those on the slides. So uh, Lois, I think that this might be your chance to take us away. of ACRL 2021 campaign scholarship or scholarship campaign rather. I posted some quick facts up on the chat box. Um, just want to tell you how pleased I am to be chairing this conference uh, scholarship committee again, this campaign. This is my, I think, third go around. So um, it's really been fun and I'm really committed to this. And pleased for the money we've raised already for the 2021 conference. Uh, um, encourage you all to get the word out about ways to donate to the campaign. It helps us uh, bring new and mid-career librarians and library school students to the conference. Um, we managed to do that for 180 people in 2019, so let's do that again and even more. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori. This is incredibly meaningful work. And yes, bringing so many people on scholarship is just one of the tremendous highlights of the conference. It is one of the, I think, one of the most wonderful things that we do as an association. So thank you. And if you, if you weren't here as you're just coming back into the room, if you look within the chat uh, box and go back a little ways, you will find that Lori's posted a wonderful summary of the work that she and the committee have been doing to raise uh, a fund scholarship, conference scholarship funds. Thank you, Elois, for a fantastic experiment with uh, breakout sessions. I hope everyone had great conversations. We don't have time today to do a group share from that, but if you had questions or ideas that arose, I hope you'll, you'll mention them to your board or staff liaison, whoever is the appropriate person to help you realize or to help you find answers to your questions. Um, we are going to wrap because we are at the end of our time. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, thank you again, all of you, for your service to ACRL and for your participation and for uh, the opportunity to work with you. It is a, a privilege and a pleasure. Um, there will be, oh, and there it is on the screen, an evaluation form. Please do give us your feedback on the session today, particularly in this new virtual feedback or in this virtual setting. It would be lovely to see how this is working for people. If you are able to come to Midwinter in person next week, we would love it if you could join us at the leadership welcome breakfast. 
Uh, this won't be a programmed or a heavily agendaed scheduled time. It's an opportunity for a little more of the networking that we usually try to provide through the Leadership Council meeting. It will be 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. on Saturday morning, bright and early in Philadelphia. Uh, if you are able to come, we would love to see you there. I think that those are the ends of my comments. So thank you again to Alois, to Mary Ellen, to the staff, and to everyone for being here. Thanks, Thank Joe, Karen. Thanks, everybody, for coming. See some of you in Philadelphia at that 7 a.m. breakfast. Free coffee and food. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thank you.